All right, so in this video, we're going to continue talking about wars of religion. And this time, we're going to take a look at uh, France. And we're going to take a look at the Habsburgs. So France, in France, the wars of religion more or less look like a civil war. But it was just as likely that the war in France could have easily turned into a larger Europe-wide conflict. It ended before it could get to that point. So it was a civil war but could have been bigger. And we'll see why in a moment. So if you remember the last time we talked about France and the church, uh, the French had a more independent relationship with the church. Remember that French kings appointed their own bishops. And we called this the Galician church. So this kind of independent mindedness within the French aristocracy kind of also trickled down to the nobility in that a lot of nobles adopted Calvinism. Uh, we call these French Calvinists Huguenots, or sometimes pronounced Huguenots, because I think that's how you would say it in French, but Huguenots. That, I've only ever really heard Huguenots. Um, now, again, like when we talked about the Dutch converting to Calvinism, it makes sense that the nobles would like Calvinism because it kind of uh, approves of their wealth and power. Remember, Calvinists believe that the wealthy and the powerful have God's favor, and that's why they are wealthy and powerful. So it makes sense that nobles would like Calvinism. So generally speaking there was a there was a sense of toleration between the catholics and the huguenots like they they didn't necessarily like each other but they tolerated each other however As the Huguenots became more influential, the toleration faded. And the Huguenots were targeted with, I guess there's no other way to put it, but like mob violence. Now, a lot of this violence was uh, instigated by the Queen of France. Queen of France 
who was Catherine de' Medici. And if you remember that name, they were one of the important Italian Renaissance families. So Catherine de' Medici was the niece of the Pope. And she was also the mother to three French kings. So they didn't last very long, but she was a very influential person in uh, kind of the, I guess the 16th century in France. So Catherine de Medici, very Catholic, uh, very Machiavellian, the ends justify the means. She wanted to get rid of the Catholics and she used her position to kind of instigate violence towards the Huguenots in order to get them to leave. Uh, the worst example of this mob violence is called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which was overnight, August 23rd, 24th, 1572. So as the name implies, uh, this was a massacre. There was a prominent Huguenot leader. His name was Henry of Navarre. And he was getting married in Paris the next day. And so the day before, on the 23rd, a bunch of his friends come to Paris to celebrate. And overnight, a lot of them are murdered in their sleep. which uh, is a big no-no at weddings. That's a big party foul. Don't murder a bunch of people before the marriage. So this event, which was probably instigated by the queen, uh, kind of turns a tense piece into a war. And the war kind of crescendos into something called the War of the Three Henrys. The War of the Three Henrys Fifteen eighty-seven to fifteen eighty-nine. So there's a lot of kind of like low-level violence, and it's going to crescendo into this big bloody affair called the War of the Three Henrys. So here are the three Henrys. The first Henry is the King of France, Henry the Third. He was a Catholic, but a moderate. And his mother was Catherine. Uh, 
the second Henry. Henry of G's. Henry of G's was a Catholic, but an extremist who wanted to eliminate all the Huguenots. And then finally, the third Henry is Henry of Navarre, who was the Huguenot who managed to escape the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. So he's the leader of the Huguenots. Uh, Henry of G's was supported by Philip. Henry of Navarre was supported by Elizabeth. And so there was the possibility that this could have turned into a Europe-wide conflict, but this is going to burn out really fast before it actually has a chance to turn into a larger conflict. So the three Henrys go out like this. The first Henry to go was Henry of G's. Henry of G's was the first killed. Uh, he took the city of Paris, but was killed by Henry III's bodyguards. He just assumed that Henry III's bodyguards would just defect to him, and so he walks into the palace to arrest Henry III, and his bodyguards just straight up murder Henry of G's. So he's gone. Next to go, is Henry III. Henry III is killed by extremist, extremist associates of G's. So they take each other out. And so the last man standing is Henry of Navarre. And he becomes Henry the Fourth. In fifteen eighty nine. Now, Henry was, and so when we're talking about Henry, I'm talking about Henry IV. Henry was a good, he was a good leader, and from all the things I've read, a pretty decent man. He was a good leader, a good man, but France was too Catholic for him to control as a Calvinist. So in 1593, he converts to Catholicism. And he famously said when he converted that Paris was worth a mass, meaning that holding on to Paris and controlling the city of Paris was worth his religious beliefs. So he was willing to sacrifice his own personally held religious beliefs 
in order to keep France from breaking out into further conflict. Paris was worth a mass. Now, the rest of this kind of continues. Henry still remained a good leader and a good man. Maybe the most important thing that he does is he passes a law called the Edict of Nantes. in 1594, I believe it's 1594, which basically legalizes Calvinism. The Edict of Nantes. He also makes peace with Spain and with the Pope. He was a big art patron. And he starts the process of turning Paris into a major city. So a lot of what modern day Paris was built on was started by Henry IV. Unfortunately, Henry also made a lot of enemies and he was assassinated in 1610. And his nine-year-old son Louis the 13th comes to power. And we will talk about Louis the 13th quite a bit when we start talking about absolute monarchy uh, because a lot of the stuff that his son Louis the 14th is going to do is put in place by his dad Louis the 13th. Uh, I'm going to flip the paper over just to finish this up. There's just a little bit left that I want to do about the Habsburgs. So if you need to finish adding this stuff to your notes, uh, hit pause here because I'm going to flip the paper over. So hit pause. Okay, I assume you've hit pause and written everything down. I'm going to flip the paper over. So just a little bit more that I wanted to add about the Habsburgs. So Christianity was not the only arena where we see conflict. So Christianity or Protestantism isn't the only arena for religious conflict. There's, there are other religious conflicts that we're seeing in Europe at the time. And the Habsburgs are kind of right in the middle of some interfaith conflicts between uh, the Catholics and the Ottoman Empire. Who, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar, the Ottoman Empire are Sunni Muslims. Now, unfortunately, the, the AP Euro curriculum doesn't really do a lot about this topic, even though most of Southeastern Europe has a long tradition of Islam. Uh, Turkey, Greece, the Balkans, there's a lot of Islamic heritage there. The, the college board seems to kind of ignore that in this course, but there is a lot of Islamic heritage and Islamic history in Southeastern Europe that the course just kind of ignores. Um, but we'll bring them up here just because I think it's fair to, because we're talking about wars of religion. Uh, so the first big outbreak of conflict between uh, the, the Catholic Habsburgs and the Sunni Ottoman Empire happens in 1529. So in 1529, 
under Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, the the Ottomans actually push quite a bit into Europe, so they actually put uh, they put Vienna under siege, which was the capital of the Austrian Empire. So Vienna is put under siege by the Ottomans, and that was kind of their high water mark, and they're pushed back after this. Now, on their way to get there, the Ottomans pretty thoroughly defeat the Hungarians, which drive them into an alliance with the Habsburgs, which we'll talk more about later. But this is kind of the start of what will eventually turn into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, kind of the causes of World War I. Now, this invasion has two, well, actually more than two, quite a few effects on European history. So let's think about some of the big effects of this invasion. First, it solidifies the Habsburgs as defenders of the church. Like they are standing up to the, the Muslims and defending the Catholic Church and defending Christianity. So the Habsburgs are the, uh, they are the country and the family that have defended the church. More than almost anybody else you can think of, the Habsburgs are synonymous with the Catholic Church and defending it. So the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburgs are seen as defenders of the church. And so this kind of puts some of the other stuff we've seen into perspective. Like, this is why they attacked Martin Luther as harshly as they did. And this is also why the Habsburgs become such strong missionaries for the church. So if we think about this as, as a similar effect as the Reconquista in Spain, It also, as I mentioned above, it solidifies Islam in Southeast Europe. So for centuries, Islam is the main religion in Southeastern Europe. So we're thinking here like uh, Greece, the Balkans, parts of Romania, there is a strong Islamic influence. Now, 
the Ottomans basically let these people remain Christian if they wanted to, but it doesn't stop there being this strong Islamic influence in southeastern Europe. And this influence is going to remain, and it's even going to be seen well into the end of the 20th century, because if we think about the, the Balkan Wars in the 1990s, there is a big religious component to that war. But we'll talk about this towards the end of the course. But this is where the seeds of that conflict started. Now, one other thing we should note about this alliance, or this, this conflict, was that the French sided with the Ottomans. And that's because the French hated the Habsburgs. Now, remember, the French were always kind of more independently minded. in terms of religion. So when it came to a political conflict or a religious conflict, the French are going to choose to hurt their political rival rather than their religious rival. And we'll see this influence come out when we start talking about the Thirty Years' War, which will be our next big topic of discussion, which is the religious war to end the religious wars. Uh, and we see this alliance between the French and the Ottomans last for another few hundred years. So this alliance between the French and the Ottomans last until the 1790s, and the French Revolution is what kind of turns the French against the Ottomans. Uh, but it really has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with the French revolutionaries being against religion in general. So the French are happy to side with the Ottomans because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If you're fighting the Habsburgs, I don't care what religion you practice as long as you're fighting the Habsburgs. All right, so I'm going to stop there. This is uh, the second of two videos on wars of religion. Uh, so the next set of videos will be on this 30 years war, which, as I just mentioned, is the religious war to end all the religious wars. After this, wars aren't really going to be about religion anymore. There'll still be religious components to wars, like the Balkan War, there was a religious component. But wars aren't going to be fought over religion Religion might be a part of wars, but it's not going to be the primary reason for wars after the Thirty Years' War. So this is our next big topic, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, and until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.